hello students. In this video lesson and in the next one, we will give a broad overview of what we mean by science. Science is a way of knowing. It's a way of trying to understand the natural world around us. In this video lesson, we will describe what is meant by empiricism, which will then lead to the next video lesson talking about the scientific method. So we say that science is a process for discovering that leads to understanding, but that understanding is about the natural physical world around us. Science is not the only way of understanding. You can acquire knowledge from a trusted authority, from your own reasoning, from your intuition, or from inspiration. These other ways of knowing are more appropriate for questions about such things as uh, truth and beauty and justice and faith. But for understanding the natural world, the method of science turns out to be what we have used for hundreds of years. And science has resulted in such understandings as Newton's laws, the understanding of the solar system, the universe, the laws of thermodynamics, electromagnetics, and electromagnetic radiation, theory of relativity, periodic table in the elements, molecular basis for life and genetics, and the theory of plate tectonics. And in this semester, we will talk about a, a number of these, in particular, the, the last three, about a little bit about the periodic table and the molecular basis for life, genetics, and, and geosciences. Plato, Aristotle, and other natural philosophers, many of whom lived before the Common Era or in the B.C. Era, attempted to understand the natural world by reasoning alone. It was only in the 16th through the 17th century that there was an emergence of, the, of modern science based on what we call empiricism, that is, making observations, making experimental observations about the natural world, which leads to an approach which we will call the scientific method, which will be the subject of the next video lesson. I show at the bottom of the slide some of the more famous scientists who led to the, what we call the scientific revolution, Copernicus, Kepler, Bacon, Galileo, and Newton. You've probably heard of many of these. An important characteristic of empirical or experimental methods is that they rely quite heavily on measurements and mathematics. We won't go into mathematics much in this course, uh, sigh of relief, but we need to know a little bit about some common measurements. These units of measurements are needed not only for empirical experimental methods, that is to perform science, but also for trade and construction transportation, and commerce in general. The most fundamental of these measurements are those for length, weight, or mass, and time. What you notice about measurements of length is that they were based on body parts. The cubit, which you've heard of, is actually the distance between the elbow and the tip of your middle finger. You also have the hand, we have the foot, the gird, the rod, uh, what we now call the mile was initially based on the Roman mile, the millipesum, which was a thousand paces. Turns out to be approximately what we now use as a mile. The current standard measure of length is the meter, which we'll talk about more in one of the next slides. We also had to have ways of measuring mass or weight, and in ancient times, mass or weight measurements were made by comparison to a number of grains of wheat or barley corn or the carob seed. Another ancient measurement of weight was a stone, which is about the size of a bowling ball or 14 pounds. Currently, we use a kilogram and gram as our units of measurement of mass or weight. And of course, we have to measure time. Now here, our units of time are determined by the year, the length of time that it takes for the Earth to orbit the Sun, and by a day, the length of time it takes for the Earth to rotate around its axis. But we also have units of time of month and hours and minutes, 12 months in a year, 24 
hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute. These units of 12 and 24 and 60 are somewhat arbitrary, turns out, but they have been with us since ancient times, and, and we use them throughout the world as our measures of minutes and seconds and hours and months. Now, throughout ancient times, different countries or regions or cultures had different local versions of these units, especially the units for measuring mass and length. And one of the very earliest legal documents, the Magna Carta, it stated, there shall be a standard measure of wine, corn, and ale throughout the kingdom. And so this was an early call for there to be standardization in our units of measure. Well, this attempt to standardize took a while. In 1668, the metric system was developed, and that metric system is the one we use today, where our units of measurements of length are in terms of a meter, a meter being 39.37 inches, a little over a yard, and of course we have a thousand meters a kilometer, which is about 0.6 miles. Our standard measure of mass is a kilogram. A kilogram weighs about 2.2 pounds. A kilogram is also approximately equal to the mass of a liter of water. So if you can imagine a liter of water, another example is a kilogram is about uh, the, the mass of a pineapple. And the standard measurement of time is the second, which we all know is how long it takes to say one Mississippi, two Mississippi. Now we have other things that we need to measure too, but we won't go into them as much in this course. We have to measure temperature. We do that in terms of Kelvin. We have to measure light intensity, candelas, electric current, amperes, and the amount of substance. We measure that in terms of moles. While we have these standard things that we measure in terms of mass and length in particular, we have to scale up and scale down. So we have these prefixes, some of which you are no doubt familiar with. I'm sure you know that a kilo meter or a kilogram means a thousand, mega means a million or 10 to the sixth, giga means 10 to the ninth. And then as we go smaller than the basic unit, we have centi, which means one hundredth, or milli, which means one thousandth, or micro, which means one times 10 to the minus six, and then nano, one times 10 to the minus ninth. So we use these prefixes to scale up or scale down these basic units of measurement. I also want to point out concepts of precision and accuracy and how these are related to errors in experimental measurements. Now the terms precision and accuracy may seem like many of you to have about the same meaning, but they turn out to be different. Precision is how well repeated measurements agree with one another, how reproducible they are. Accuracy is how close the measurement is to the true value, assuming that the true value somehow would be known. And both of these, both precision and accuracy, can be compromised by experimental errors. If you look at the diagram at the bottom, which looks like a set of bullseyes, imagine that you're shooting a shotgun or repeatedly shooting an arrow with a bow and arrow. We have these four patterns. If you look at the bottom patterns, both of these patterns have high precision. This is what the term precision means. Each measurement, or each shot from the bow and arrow, hits at about the same place. But as in the one to the bottom left, you may not be hitting the bullseye, but you may have a very narrow pattern, but not at the true value. So the bottom two patterns represent precise measurements. A very close pattern is the way to consider precise, if you're thinking in terms of a, of a shotgun. The top two have less precision, but of these top two, the one on the right has the higher accuracy. That is, on average, the one on the right, if you, if you averaged all of the measurements, would be at the center of the bullseye, whereas the one on the upper left obviously missed the bullseye. So this is what we mean by accuracy. If you averaged or made enough measurements, that measurement would be at the center or would be the true value. Now, obviously, you would rather be both precise and accurate. That's what we'd like to achieve when making experimental measurements. Both the precision and the accuracy of experimental measurements can be compromised by errors. And the two principal types of errors are what we call random errors and systematic errors. Random errors are more things like electrical noise. 
systematic errors may be due to a miscalibration of an instrument and are actually easier to handle. Now we're going to pause, have a little quiz, and then go on to another video lesson in which we talk about the scientific method. See you shortly.